I'm joined in the studio by my dear friend and uh, drummer from the Pablo Head Trio, Jonas Burgwinkel. Hello. Hello. Thanks for being here with me. And uh, we're talking about the first album that we did together. And uh, in my recollection, we did sort of test recordings for Pirouette Records. We, we were invited to come to their studio yeah. in Munich. And we were all very excited because it was a cool label. And uh, my teacher was on there, Hubert Nuss. And the test recordings went well, but still, I think afterwards, Jason Seitzer, the producer, wasn't wasn't totally happy with with what we got. So he invited us back for right. some more. And right now, I'm not sure what exactly ended up on the record. What is from which session, you know? Yeah, maybe we can find out by listening to it again. Yeah. Two questions, one answer is uh, inspired by Alan Holdsworth and you introduced me to his music. Mm -hmm. I remember showing you Against the Clock from yes. Wardenclyffe Tower, one of my favorite Alan Holdsworth tracks. Yeah. And I don't know why what exactly the answer was, no, what the questions were, but I know what the answer was uh, that I'm referring to in the title. I think I was dealing with two separate questions in my life at that time, and both uh, questions had, or I, I arrived at the answer that I had to relax. Good answer, anyways. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what question. <laughs> Do you remember the first time we played the piece or how you um, approached the piece when I gave it to you? Because I don't. <laughs> uh, me neither. I just remember f uh, feeling it like an immediate, like a nice, it has a nice flow to it. You don't really have to do much. Mm. To, uh, it has its own momentum. Yeah. I didn't really think of Alan Holsworth playing it, to be honest, yes. but um, maybe that's a good thing. Yeah. Can you... I, I remember uh, playing on these drums and uh, Billy Hart has, uh, was yes. the, the session right before us and he tuned the drums so nicely. Uh, I never, uh, uh, and I, I just left them right uh, where, where he had them, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, it was so much fun playing on this uh, kit tuned up by him. Yeah. I think I, he told me how he tunes his drums. Mm -hmm. in a, uh, I think it's a F major chord over A, that's his tuning. A is his bass drum? Yes. And then C, F, A. That's his tuning. Uh, he has three toms. Maybe there's a, something that's doubling those notes, but there's no extra note. I think uh, when, I, when I talked with him, uh, I, I asked the same question and yeah. I told him about this recording session. Oh, yeah. No. I think now we arrive at the last part, the coda, which isn't inspired so much by Alan Holsworth, but more by, I think, during that time, I was, I was still on my big uh, Radiohead um, trip. Yeah, uh, we w went on that trip together for a while. Yes, <laughs> and I think I remember, I, I wanted to get close to a certain vibe from them with that coda a little bit. It's also part that um, uh, was coming back also m many years later when we didn't really had the tune in our repertoire anymore, but this part reappeared mm -hmm. every now and then. Can you dive back into memories of stuff that you were uh, checking out at that time or working on, now that you listen to yourself solo over, over a part like that? Um, I was wondering about the same thing. Yeah, 
many things I'm playing there I'm not really playing anymore. Right, same here. <laughs> oh. I heard some Brian Blade, I think. Mm. Some influence. But it's such a long time ago. Yeah. It's like seeing an old picture of yourself, right? Or is it hard for you to to recognize yourself? No, no. no. Is there also stuff that you can't play anymore? For sure, yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Not because it's too hard, it's just not in my system anymore. Yeah. So it's different things now. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like... Uh, <laughs> uh, some sort of reptile that you you skin yourself uh -huh. and, and there's different things uh, you all it's still the same person but your your sh your colors change and your uh, haptics maybe mm -hmm. yeah it makes sense Did you notice? It was uneven, the intro. Yeah. Yeah. And, but... We didn't play it like that. It was a joke that Jason, when he was <laughs> mixing the record, he, he, he found it funny to, uh, to shorten the intro so it, it, it's, it's not even. Mm -hmm. Because I remember later when we played that song, I used to do that. That it's not always bo boom, bo one, yeah. bo one, but uh, yeah, displacing it, yeah. but in a very uh, smooth way, that it doesn't really pop out. Yeah, but maybe it wasn't your ideas in the first first place. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, but it's actually the first time I realize that. Yeah. Uh, now. You yeah, mean, yeah. Yeah. The other day I was listening to "On the Lake" by uh, Peter Erskine, mm -hmm. and I found the same groove that you're playing. Did you think of this piece when we re recorded this? In, not really, um, in, in a way, because this groove I, I played for, for a while, mm. but without knowing that record. But by someone, like a, a dear friend of mine by, by that time, like way, way earlier, Willem van Dijk, a bass player, I played in his band, and he told me about a groove like that. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know it, and I just... I tried different things and yeah, yeah, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then, then later I found out, oh, okay, he, he meant exactly that groove. Ah, okay. It's like a kind of backwards situation. Mm -hmm. might have been from the first recording session. The tune itself was inspired by a dream that I had of walking through an enchanted forest. Um, and the legend says that if you walk through this forest, uh, you'll, you'll forget everything. happens when you dream something right I mean yeah you forget what what you had what you went through yes <laughs> yeah I can hear Hubert Nuss's influence on me big time here he was in the studio for the very first recording. No, the for second. the first, for the second. For right. the second, he as was there. Yeah, as co-producer. Yes, but he's he's not credited. But we give him credit here. It was mm -hmm. great that he was there and helped us to relax, actually. And um, he has a way of saying only little things, but opening doors. 
enhancing what's there already maybe, but uh, making room for it more. You would say stuff like, yeah, you could bring out the melody a little bit more here or um, don't force it too much or whatever. Mm. It's funny, I, I remember it that we played it slower than this. It's pretty fast. True. Maybe you're old. <laughs> I like it in that tempo, though. Yeah. There's a lot of space for Robert. Somehow. Like today, he isn't here. <laughs> A lot of space. <laughs> I think that what it also became more... He used that space more and more the more we played that tune. Mm -hmm. Life. Yeah. Drive by Tony Williams. Yeah, I, I kind of remember that take, playing that take. Oh yeah? Yeah, because I think you just, we never played that before. No. You just brought it to the recording session and hey, let's try this. And I'm not sure if that's the first or the second take. I think first take, yeah. But it was just, yeah, the energy was there and mm -hmm. you just played it. And it was very nice, uh, yeah. pretty much the opposite of Forest of Oblivion or other tunes that we really rehearsed a lot, mm -hmm. and tried to play right and mm -hmm. sort of things that we just played like we we used to play, yeah, in Jazz Keller Bond or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, here we, we just stated the theme and now we're playing freely. There's no form, although on the original by Miles. Right now I'm not so sure anymore if, if they, there might be a form that they are playing. At that time when I transcribed this piece, I was pretty certain, yeah, there's, there's no form, they're just playing free. Now I'm not so sure anymore. you have some issues with your arm one of those sessions or was it a, another one I think it was before those sessions oh, okay. but I had troubles yeah I had tendonitis and Hubert Nuss actually helped me to overcome this because I was yeah I was tensing up when I was playing when I was playing fast trying to play fast yeah and uh like two questions one answer <laughs> the answer is relax and uh, during that time of you know Hubert was instrumental uh, with giving me answers for a lot of questions that I had no Handshive is also one of the songs from the Miles Davis Quintet that I played along with the most. It has a nice tempo, a nice vibe. Mm -hmm. I could come for the other solos or I could just play solos on top of that.
but that was we played it all in one room right but there was a part of the recording session where I was in a small room yeah but I remember playing hand jive all in one room yeah yeah remember going into this outro thing and it so, certainly has a first take vibe discovering the piece yeah it's very nice to have in this setting it's always nice mm. Interlude is, uh, I think, Jason Seitzer, our producer, re requested um, that we should play something free. I don't know how many interludes of these we did, but he said he said that at one point, maybe we reached a dead end or something. Probably like three or four. Mm -hmm. but. Also, another remembrance of that recording was Jason putting up uh, walls of separation between us so we couldn't give each other uh, visual cues. Yeah, that's coming later with melody. Oh, with melody? Yeah. Oh, okay. Wasn't that the first time you went to the studio? No. No. No, I had some, but it wasn't like I had big, um, big uh, experiences, a lot of experiences before in the studio. It was every time I went to the studio, I was super excited. Yeah. I mean, I, I still am, but uh, it was something where I didn't have much experience. Yes, but it wasn't the first time. have to think of our Radiohead uh, project again where we just dwell on uh, sounds mm. and um, moods for yeah, That was one year before that we, we did a concert or two concerts where we only played Radiohead pieces Yeah, right and I think we got into similar vibes like that That's correct
Phasen. We usually started out Phasen with a drum intro, I think, at that time. Sounds like it. Ooh. And this is a piece I still wrote at home when I was living at home, I think. I wrote this before I came to Cologne. A friend of ours once called that the trio smash hit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we like to play it in uh, very high energy and uh, it sounds way harder than it is. Just It's just off beats, right? Yep. But it, yeah, it works very mm -hmm. well. It was, it's fun to play it too. Mm. And we still play it sometimes. Yeah. At least parts of it. And um, this is, I think this is from the first recording, so from the test recording for Pirouette. And um, after that first test recording, Jason told us to yeah, come back in half a year and get some more material. And I think... I wrote Phase 2, phase phase which is also on the record. We'll get to that later um, for the second recording session. So you have the smash it and the, the follow-up <laughs> follow in one record. <laughs> yeah. I think we kind of insisted of having this version on the record. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, we tried on the second session and it didn't... Yeah, also, uh, I think Jason wanted us to play it uh, calmer, with, mm -hmm. with less life energy, but we liked that. Yeah. Because uh, that was a big part of our uh, live performance mm. thing, and, it, and it, especially for, for a debut recording, we wanted to have at least once that kind of energy and color yes. on it. definitely a, a, a phase for us to uh, to get to know Jason and his his vibe and yeah. vice versa also and I think uh, we had, had to get used to the way he was maybe demanding things or not saying things at times and out of that grew a very dear friendship that span over more than a decade now and uh, I think we are really we're really thankful for him to to give to have given us this opportunity and and trust in us. And this is the my first re recording, our first trio recording, and out of that grew I don't know how many <laughs> nine, ten recordings, twelve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a special situation. I mean, for him, because we were such a group, a strong group of three friends, yeah. having our own humor and everything. And, yeah. But at the same time, being very nervous about this producer of this label that we haven't met yet. Yes. Um, uh, and he has like a very calm and sometimes mysterious vibe. So yeah. it wasn't easy to. find a common ground uh, in the beginning but we was yeah it was a search but um, yeah didn't uh, music turn out uh, well so yeah maybe that's a good thing yeah with those off beats it's very funny because as soon as we play even now a tempo like that and somebody plays an off beat like the one and yes <laughs> <laughs> we all think of that tune, yes. and we uh, were very tempted to go in that. Yeah, like an inside joke uh, already. Oh yeah. Oh, 
Oh, we're in the farm now. Mm -mm -mm. And head again. Then uh, Wayne Shorter quote had still had a also very strong influence. Yes, like, always does, but mm. especially at that time. Yes, I, th I think Beyond the Sound Barrier came out in 2005 and Footprints Live came out in 2002. And I've, I, I was listening to so many bootlegs of that album. I mean, not of that album, of that group. And uh, showing it to you guys, or we were exchanging bootlegs. So yeah, it had a big influence on us. And sometimes when I would play the song, I, I would imagine him <laughs> playing with us. Mm -hmm. What a nice thought. <laughs> And that's Melody, the tune we already talked about, where Jason Seitzer pulled one of his producer tricks. Because <laughs> um, it has lots of uh, long pauses, this tune, and there's not much rhythm happening bet between them. Yeah. And the hard thing about it is uh, to be together, but not making it sound like you really want to be together <laughs> and it's super important to you yes <laughs> so it um, sounds tense <clears throat> so um, um and uh, i think we had different techniques how we approach this problem but uh, i think jason didn't want us to look at each other to have any like yeah visual cues or something yeah so he uh, he put walls between us, so that there was that we were completely blind. <laughs> yes. But the, we had really had to just trust that we're together. And uh, I remember it felt great, but it didn't work in some places. Uh, I think we tried like th three takes with those walls, and then um, then he put them away again. And then the take that happened then. Oh, yeah. Wow, okay. Um, I didn't remember. We d uh, and at that point, we weren't looking at each other anymore. Yeah. But you had the option, so that was, would take some stress from yeah. you. Like, in case of emergency, <laughs> you could always, like, okay, where is he? Yeah. Um...
It was also funny uh, Jason style that he would just start rolling in those walls without <laughs> yeah. commenting. He didn't say <laughs> well, a word. Like, uh, what hey, what's happening? <laughs> Is the recording session over? <laughs> 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 yeah, it was this funny thing where it's kind of you don't understand why your parent is telling you to to wear to wear uh, a, hat. A, a hat or or a jacket or whatever a rain jacket but afterwards you understand yeah, it's it's better for us <laughs> and you know a couple of years ago we played the 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 Zendesal in Bremen and they have a special program where you play without light they can they can uh, they can get rid of all the lights in the room and there's basically just uh, you stay stare into nothing it's you it's can't see it darkness, yeah. yeah and that that's actually taking it to a next level what jason did to us uh, and it was so good for us i thought and and i i st after that um I force myself to close close my eyes more when I play, actually, because I get distracted. And it's funny that you say that because uh, for me, I was really looking forward to that because I play with my eyes closed most of the time, anyways. Mm. But there are certain moments that I can really use them. Yes. Uh, for example, to find my sticks. <laughs> <laughs> really, those things I didn't think of that before yeah. uh, the concert. Really, you have to put them in your mouth. Yeah, that's the maybe. trick. Uh, because uh, I was really enjoying it, and then okay, I have my brushes. Where are the mallets? And then you start like searching with your hands, and something falls down, and you oh. Um, and, and I would think like, oh, what a perfect idea <laughs> to drop the stick at this moment. I I don't think I, I dropped something, but it, I, it definitely took some concentration of the music for me just mm, to get it I organized. See. Yeah, probably if we do, would have done it a second time, I would have. Yeah. come up with some kind of system yeah because i think the rehearsal was with lights yes so was <laughs> really like oh i didn't realize it was uh, yeah it changes the way you play also i, I remember doing uh, kind of um, jumps or something isn't really possible for me then you know i would really have to trust if i go from the low register with the jump with with nothing in between to the to the upper register i wouldn't really do stuff like that i would stay more or or build build a movement like that mm. wow we totally lost sight of melody <laughs> talking about that gig in bremen <laughs> yeah but, but it's it's connected it's con it's connected and um i remember when i wrote melody i wanted to write something without melody but obviously the top notes of the chords create a melody that was kind of an uh, aha moment for me and uh, also with the with the rhythm i wanted to find something that wasn't really identifiable rhythmically on a on a grid level or something and that is a topic that has stayed with me i think for since then uh, it it came back in in different Pieces. Yeah, that that tune had really had an influence also on the trios playing and influ and um, how we would approach this kind of situation, mm -hmm. uh, especially this thing that you just trust that you're being together. And if it's if you're not being like rhythmically a hundred percent together, it's not uh, the end of the world. Right. But it's more important that you really hit those uh, notes and really mean them at, at that moment it will still sound better than mm. try, being uh, yeah hesitant about them uh, yeah yeah will never sound as good yes and now in retrospect i think pieces like dicke d or something is a continuation of, definitely yeah of melody Was that a dedication, that tune? I was thinking of the um, Alfred Hitchcock movie, Vertigo, which ah. is still, I guess, my favorite movie. 
especially in that moment here. Right, I remember. This has the zooming effect like that. But, but remember that it also reminded me of Chris Potter. Yeah, that's that's a nice record too. Yeah. I used to listen to that a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a good one, yeah. I think Vertigo was recorded twice. Once for the test recording and once for the um, for the actual recording in December. And I think this is from the second one. We tried it again and found another. Or we had just a half a year of more experience of, of playing it. I think I was more happy with the first version, but you were more happy ah. with that one. And I could... Tell us, what, what happened in the first... <laughs> and, um, I just... Uh, maybe it was also just the subjective thing of remembering playing the take and feeling really good about it. Mm -hmm. And... Um, yeah. But uh, that's... That's always a trap. Yeah. It, 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 uh, sometimes you're not listening really then because you think you already know the answer mm -hmm. you're just looking for those clues and not listening to the mm. rest so much in the end I agreed anyways so I mean how is it for you in this this was our first record together and by now we have done 12 or 13 <laughs> records together, which is yeah. hilarious. <laughs> and, and maybe we even did more with other groups. Yes, of course, yeah. yeah. But I remember we all were very... Um, it was important to us to get it right, the first album. Absolutely, yeah, because it, it turned, yeah, how everything developed pretty fast for this trio. Yeah. And um, yeah, we were really focusing on that and really rehearsing yeah. for it. We still rehearse for the newer albums and the more recent albums. But I feel I'm not as, um, I can let go more and uh, say, okay, that's the take. I, I've fucked up uh, certain places or I, uh, um, I, I can allow certain things more, I guess. Because yep. you have some done so many records that there's a in a, in a way there's a, a an accurate picture of yourself and your your playing out there already that can be seen or that somebody can get. Yes, um, and when you're younger, it's. Uh, a different sort of focus again when you do something uh, important you um, there hasn't there hasn't been so many other topics then it was easier to really uh, focus on on one thing right yeah and plus of course that what you just mentioned at the younger age you still also worried about technical things mm. m way more than now because mm -hmm. you know it um, um, the, the, you, you don't hurt the music if if you're not maybe like technically at 200 or 120 percent. It's more important that you musically at 100 percent. Yeah. Um, but especially as a, in a debut album, you try to put it all in there. Yes. It has to be perfect, <laughs> like in every uh, uh, every aspect of it. Yeah, I think I, I relaxed with every album. Uh, I relaxed a little bit more. <laughs> it's like now I'm asleep. No. <laughs> I always liked that tune. It was always, uh, nice to play. And but the solo form is a bit uh, hard. solo form isn't exactly what the form of the song is it might be a little bit more simplified yeah not hard in a way of okay there's seven eight and um, but uh, there's not many catching things to um, mm. 
So if you get lost, you might be in trouble. Yeah. And now we, yeah, we go back to the middle of the piece. <laughs> and I remember, yeah, when you played those dotted quarter notes, I, I had to <laughs> really hold on to everything to not get lost <laughs> or take this as the new quarter note. Mm, yeah. I think I could hear a little bit of that um, anxiety, like, <laughs> oh, the last couple of bars, let's not make a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, funny, like, don't lose thing. your nerves now, please. Yes, let's mm. drive this thing, this thing back home <laughs> safely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Tim. <laughs> Pajaro Triste is one of my favorite pieces by Federico Monpo. And uh, I did a reharmonization of, of the piece, but it's still very close to the original. first record of us but after after that I think on almost all of the records we played some classical pieces that I rearranged for us mm -hmm. so this is the start also of that journey A lot of space. Hmm. Trying to formulate a thought, but it's hard. <laughs> I like that how much space here uh, we have here. And it's something that we maybe should listen to at some point <laughs> again together. It's a good reminder. <laughs> but also, I feel like we weren't able to get to certain detailed places yet. Or like um, we didn't know as many colors yet. And like, yeah. if we would play that now, there were certain rhythmical or harmonic or melodic places in between that we would easily be mm. able to access, maybe. Organically. Yeah. But all, although maybe that gets in the way of leaving space, <laughs> because, you know, there's mm -hmm. the, the element of just because, because you can something. And I, I don't want to give the impression that we're like, we have superpowers now or whatever. But still, this is 14 years ago. Um, I think I see I see see music a little bit clearer now than I did then. It was more blurry for me. <laughs> it's a paradox, I, I think, because it's more pure and it's. 
uh, more fragile. But I also, and I know that back then I didn't know <laughs> a lot of things that I wanted to know. And by now I think I've gotten more close to, to knowing them. Like, do you remember how you wanted to sound? Yeah, that's what I was thinking about. Um, I think there was also the thought that some you you could still hear our influences more clearly because the yes. pressure we were just in the process of processing all this music we mm. would listen to, and then we're suddenly this record uh, company um, that already released this and that, and Mark Copeland and blah blah, and. Um, this big John Taylor influence, obviously, um, studying in Cologne. Um, and we try to have have that too, I think, or with a tune like that, this kind of ECM space thought was definitely in my head. Mm -hmm. I wasn't trying to play like Joey Barron or Peter Erskine, like mm. precise, precise, precisely. But um, this kind of sound and the, yeah, how you use or not use the space would be a part of my playing. Mm. Might have been from the first recording. I was influenced by obviously Wayne's original version, but also Kenny Kirkland's version. And by that time, also during that time, Aaron Parks also had a version of Anna Maria on his MySpace page that I used to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think those were the the versions of that song that were in my head at that time. What uh, what band did he play that with? I don't remember. Such a beautiful melody, incredible. Yeah, I always enjoy playing that tune. Mm. St still like it. I also think it's one of those tunes we didn't uh, record so so much. No. It was like two versions or something. Yeah. And also this coming from the first session, I think that's right. Yeah. Because we didn't feel like, yeah, it felt like, yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. For us. How old were you when we recorded that? Nine years old. Who would have thought a young boy, 
No, uh, I think I was 18 or 19. 19. Yeah, 19. I think I was really trying to get a horn-like approach in my solo soloing at that point, and I think maybe in this piece I arrived at that the most from from all those pieces. Not re really thinking so pianistically, and it's a thread that I'm still um, trying to develop. And I don't know. I think that at some point during that story, was I was on a on a triplet path that I couldn't really get out of. Yeah, <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> but this is a nice contrast of you guys, kind of driving the, the vehicle, yeah. and I I was sort of floating on top. Yeah, we still do that sometimes. <laughs> yeah. But I think by now we. Every one of us uh, can be the guy who floats on top, and the other can, the other guys can be the supportive guy for uh, for the others more. Or let's say I can be maybe more supportive and not float on top all the time. <laughs> yeah, I mean sometimes we talk about those things. We, we are feeling this one kind of playing situation that comes up too many times. Right. We, um, yeah, try to approach it and try it in a different way. Mm -hmm. And this situation also happened very often, like the vamping on an end vamp and then trying to find the the, the ending together. I have many memories of that, mm -hmm. doing that with you guys. Final piece of the first album, Phase 2, Phase 2. Oh, it's fast. It's pretty fast, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. the conclusion. Yeah. I remember Hubert voting for this take. And I think we were struggling. I mean, it was hard to play over this, this piece and yeah. to have it feel at ease at the tempo. Which one of those symbols do you still play? I think I still play both, actually. But I, I remember you played also the that symbol that also looked so funny. Um, the wobbly one? Yeah. Um, I, I didn't hear it on that record till now. I, I have a have this 18-inch K crash right thing that, uh, that I don't really play anymore that often. But... For the rest, it's pretty much the same cymbal setup I mostly play now. Mm. I mean, also I, I play this 24-inch uh, with all those uh, holes and and, them and yeah. cuts and everything. But uh, in general, that's still a very common setup for me. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Why didn't you? I have so many cymbals, and I uh, and I I play a lot. Uh, Lots of them, but I somehow always came back to to these because they have a very uh, specific way of uh, blending with the music. It's that's for me the most important thing: how the symbol blends with yeah. certain instruments, and especially that uh, Istanbul. Um, it's an Istanbul, not an Istanbul K. That I worked on myself a little bit, and I have that since I'm like 17 or something. It has a way of not getting in the way of the piano. Right. 
um, but still being uh, and has lots of uh, attack, but also you can crash it. Yeah, uh, it's it just like, works. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, it's not that I didn't try to find something sure, else. Sure, yeah. Do you remember how you made a tempo like this? And yeah, just to be clear, this isn't super fast, but it was fast for us. Uh, how how did you make a tempo like this? This uh, feel feel like like this? Um, by playing much faster, because that's maybe like 320 or something. And I used to practice like tempos above 400, mm -hmm. so that tempo would feel yeah at ease almost. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, and um, one of the keys of playing those tempos is, for me, uh, getting rid of all those things that don't work at the tempo anymore. Mm. Like, because uh, that's w one of the major problems when you, there's lots of comping ideas you can still play at the tempo of like 250, but then mm. there's this break, okay, there's just no way you can play triplets <laughs> at 320 that will still sound like triplets and not just mm -hmm. like... <laughs> Yeah, and plus you're getting cramps in your fingers and everything. Mm. So um, you kind of have to find a new vocabulary that um, works in that tempo, which is uh, basically omitting many things yeah. and still in, still having the complete set of language. Yeah, and of course uh, uh, with a part like this, you can also think in whole notes. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's yeah. I think this is m m at least the third or fourth uh, drum solo on the record. Yeah, what happened? So, uh, we don't have so much drum solos no. anymore. Maybe You've said it, it all in those drum <laughs> solos. Yeah, right. It was just too good. <laughs> um, <it was laughs> I think yeah, there's maybe one, one drum solo on the, the last recording. Yes. Also over vamp and not um, yes. with a lots of with a, not with a lot of space. Yeah. Very complicated. Yeah. So the connecting thread between Phasen and Phase 2 is, I guess, a catchy eight-bar vamp <laughs> with a melody that. We just arrived at fast and, and a had fast something. Tempo. Yes, and fast tempo. This was also the last song that we recorded during that session. After that, we were finished. And we still wouldn't know if this would be coming out, right? Or was it? Yeah, I mean, it, it took a long time for for the actual record to be finished. I mean, I didn't hear from Jason for a couple of months, and we were kind of uh, were unsure what will happen with it. Obviously. Very scary for first album mm. that was so, somewhat to be released. So it took, we recorded it in December 2007 and it came out in September of 2008, which isn't that long now that I think of it. But if but you're it unsure, it, it felt super long. Especially yeah. for a guy like you, you really <laughs> like to make decisions like right away, yes. and fast and get it out of the way. Yes. Not really your style. Yes. Just keep it uh, somewhere in between yeah. for months. Yeah. 